Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast for farmers and ag professionals by the Iowa Farm Bureau, bringing you the news, experts, and educational insights that matter most. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our November 28th edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today's episode features a relatively new grant program for farmers and others who are investing in creative ways to expand the use and consumption of Iowa ag products. And later in the episode, we'll bring on a tax expert to help you get up to speed on some of the most important considerations as you're filing this year's farm income taxes. First, we have Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag with us to discuss the Choose Iowa Grant Program, which is designed to support farmers and others who are looking to add value to the ag products grown in our state. Spokesman reporter Bob Bion has the story. Secretary Nag, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, let's start with the Choose Iowa Marketing and Promotion Grants. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. How did this program come about initially, and what is it geared to do? Yeah, you bet. This is all about creating new market opportunities for uh, farmers and livestock producers, really of all kinds across the state of Iowa. And, you know, what I've been kind of saying all along about this is it really took on new life or gained new momentum coming out of, of COVID the last couple of years. You know, you've already got a a growing trend for consumers wanting to shop local. And then you add into that this disrupted supply chain where we're all thinking about how do we shorten the distance between the farm and the plate. And so it's really a convergence of those two things, I think, that have brought us to where we are today with launching, really scaling up Choose Iowa, all about establishing a well-known Iowa brand. I'm just excited about what that can mean, both for producers because of additional market opportunities, but for consumers as well, because they're the ones that ultimately benefit from even more choices. And it's just really exciting thing. How much is available in funding this year? And how does that compare to the last program? Uh, You bet. So part of this Choose Iowa effort is value added agriculture. And one of the components to that is this grant program. We're in the second year of that this year. First year, we had $250,000 available for grants. This year, it'll be uh, $460,000. So again, that's based on tremendous demand and interest in the program. And when we presented that to the legislature, they were interested as well in seeing us do even more of this work. So uh, excited to be able to expand our grant offering this year. Why is this an important grant program for the state of Iowa, particularly for farmers, businesses, and nonprofits? What are we attempting to achieve by providing money for these efforts? We think that these grants, and, and they're not they're not huge grants by any means. The cap is $25,000. That can be a lot for a, an entity, a particular project. But in the grand scheme of things, these are relatively modest grants, and, and uh, they are competitive, by the way. We only want to fund the very best of these applications, and we've already got a really good experience with that just, just one year in. But our ability to help de-risk some of these investments that farmers and and, uh, operations want to make to try a new market uh, or to try to get into a new product line. Those things can be very risky. And so this helps sort of provide the incentive, if you will, to take that next step. It it likely doesn't fund the entirety of of any one particular project. In fact, there's there's a match requirement for these applicants. And so we know that it's just one piece of it. But if it can be the thing, that uh, allows a farmer, allows a, an organization to take that next step, then we will have accomplished something uh, great here. And of course, we also, again, are, are see this as an opportunity to diversify Iowa's agriculture, to expand on that, to create new market opportunities. And that's been a focus of mine. I, you know, I've, I've said all along, whether it's building markets at the international level or domestically or very locally, uh, those are all great things for us to be doing, and it's an important responsibility, I think, for the Secretary of Ag and the and the Department of Ag. So this is the second year of the program. Would you mind giving us a recap of the first year and the program's success? Yeah, it is. Uh, and, and again, I would say this, that just by virtue of the fact that we have nearly double the funding to provide, I think should tell folks uh, about that first year's experience. And uh, we were able to, again, with $250,000 last year, we had over $2 million worth of requests. And uh, we ended up funding 13 projects. 
So again, it tells you there were some really great projects that did not get funded because we had limitations on, on budget. And so we really were able to say at the end of this that those 13 were among the absolute best as they were scored and, and judged against each other. So uh, that was our first experience was funding 13. What are you looking for in a successful applicant? Really at the core of all this is we are trying to expand the usage of Iowa grown, Iowa made, Iowa raised products. And so I don't care if you're talking about, you know, we've funded fruit and vegetable uh, production and processing. We've uh, seen a lot of interest on the part of on-farm dairy processing. And, you know, one of the great examples I like to use is uh, Country View Dairy, who's put in a uh, frozen yogurt line because they were able to make use of these dollars. Well, so that's a whole new product line for them. And again, it used more of their milk is now going into the marketplace through their market channel, allowing them to capture that margin and uh, be able to provide more uh, products for their customers or brewing. If you're a brewer and you uh, can incorporate more locally grown grains or even hops into that brewing or distilling, again, that's what this is all about. Trying to use more Iowa grown products, scale that up, and ultimately, we're building a brand here, too. We want consumers to be able to recognize that that Choose Iowa brand means something and that it really capitalizes on Iowa's early tremendous and I, I would say unmatched brand for agriculture and reputation for agriculture. We're just trying to take that to the next level here with local. Yeah. So you mentioned dairy and brewing. Let's talk about another success story. Uh, maybe Skyview Farms of Nora Springs, a grant recipient last year. Last month, you visited the Cunningham Farm to make the announcement that the grant program is being offered again this year. What can you tell us about the Skyview Farms project and how the grant funds will be used there? Oh, I just think the Skyview Beef and Laura and Aaron Cunningham, uh, they exemplify what we're trying to accomplish here, right? You've got a a family farm that was already looking at this direct to consumer beef market, which has been very popular and growing. And I think sky's the limit on, on what can happen here in terms of direct to consumer meat production in the state of Iowa. And in this case, you know, you've got a family from Nora Springs, North Central Iowa, that's doing this and they're using their grant money to really expand that go to market strategy through their online uh, offering, but also uh, working on building and, and retrofitting a storefront in a barn uh, on their farm. And there's so many good things about that. One, of course, the ability to, for them to move more product to more consumers is a great thing. But I think about all of the consumers who are going to show up on that farm, on that family farm, and be able to see with their own eyes how the Cunninghams do it, where, they, uh, where their operation is. They can see for themselves, meet them personally. There is tremendous value in that in the long run, just because boy, we need more consumers understanding the realities of where their food comes from. And so I love that they are uh, incorporating this storefront, if you will, on their farm. And, and there'll be uh, dividends paid, not for, just for their business, but I believe for a, a better informed consumer all the way around. Applicants are being encouraged to apply now for these grants. Can you highlight what types of projects the monies can be used for, such as new processing or packaging equipment or even employee training? Again, applications are, we're taking them now. The deadline is December 15th. So uh, really would encourage folks to take note and get us an application. We would love to see the project. You know, you can purchase equipment for processing. Again, on-farm dairy processing has been one a good example of that, where you could put in a processing line of some kind, a bottling line, a packaging line. Uh, you know, we're looking at funding food hubs and distributors, you know, to be able to expand their local foods offerings direct to consumer technology, again, using maybe an online uh, system to be able to take orders and, and deliver coolers, refrigeration, grading, packaging, labeling, all of those types of things are allowed. You know, we really want to, we've tried to keep the criteria very broad because one thing I was just blown away with uh, in all of the applications last year was the diversity, the range of types of projects there were frankly some things that I didn't know there was as much interest in cut flowers, for instance, as what there is. And I think that's going to be a growth area in the state of Iowa. And so that's a learning for me. And there will be many, many others. One of the things we won't fund because there's a well-established grant program for expanding meat processing, we do not fund those projects through this grant program. There is a parallel program through Economic Development Authority that is specifically targeted to meat lockers. That's one example of something that we we won't fund through this project, but it's only because 
there's dollars being made available in other places. So would really encourage folks go to chooseiowa.com. You can find the program guidelines there and it lays out very specifically the types of expenditures that are allowed and, and it gives some examples of things that are not uh, eligible. How are the grant recipients selected and how is it determined how much funding they will receive? There's a participant match as well, right? That's correct. And well, I mentioned it a couple of times, this is a competitive grant program and, it, and that's as it should be. You know, we want to fund projects that are uh, the best in class. We're going to look at, you know, again, they'll all be scored in a uniform way, looking at things like, again, how much of an increase will we see in the usage of Iowa grown, Iowa made, Iowa raised products? There's a timeliness to this, too. There's some projects that are really good, but they might not be ripe for funding just yet. You know, maybe they're still a couple of years out in terms of when they would really be ready to make use of funding. And so we want things that can be accomplished in the next year, in the next 12 months. We're also looking for that diversity, right? We want to make sure that we don't just look at one particular segment of Iowa ag, that we are seeing a diversity in the types of grant projects that we are we are funding. And so that's taken into consideration as well. But they are scored by a committee, and, and that includes some folks that are internal to the Department of Ag and also external as well. So uh, quite a process, and I'm excited to, again, see the, the range of applications that come in this year. Folks can find more information. They can either go to chooseiowa.com or they can always visit the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship website, iowaagriculture.gov. But again, the deadline is uh, quickly approaching December 15th. So lastly, what do you think the future of the program will bring? Do you see this continuing into the future and potentially growing even from this year? I really do. I think we are really onto something here. I think it's two parts. Again, because of the the interest that I see on the part of producers of all kinds across the state, particularly beginning farmers, small farmers, specialty crop producers, livestock producers who are trying to, again, try to control their own destiny, if you will, and try to grab some of that market and process locally. We're seeing an increase in local meat processing that I think contributes to this as well. And again, all of this culminates in a consumer who has even more choices. And I think consumers are out there begging for and demanding local quality products, and we can do that. And I just think there's so much potential here. And uh, really, we're just starting to scratch the surface. The next thing that'll come to is uh, we are going to quickly scale up the whole brand uh, around Choose Iowa, that not just these grants, but also how we talk about and how we promote the brand of Choose Iowa and all of the diversity within that. I think that will generate even more interest and excitement on the part of consumers. And I think it'll have even more farmers looking at, well, hey, what are the opportunities here uh, for us? But again, I look at that next generation. I think of the Cunninghams. I think of other folks that I've met in the last few years who are, it's never been easy to get into agriculture. It's particularly difficult right now, given the cost of everything. But if there are ways to get into this kind of space, to market locally, to market direct to consumers, to capture some more margin, to generate some some cash flow and revenue. I think this is a huge opportunity for those beginning farmers. And uh, that's something that really excites me in this as well. Do you think there might be some more funding at the state level? We're going to look at that. Uh, What I want to make sure that we're doing is that we are running a a very lean program, that we're an efficient program, and that we're only funding great projects that are ready to go and getting a return on those investments. And so very pleased that we were able to nearly double the funding for the grants this year. I want to see how this year goes. I, I never want to be in a position of asking for something that we don't need. And right now, the legislature has funded the Choose Iowa program, and we will be bringing on a new director for that program very soon and announcing that. One component of that is this grant program. And what I would say is if we are funding great projects and there's increasing demand out there, I could very well see us asking for additional funding in the coming years. But uh, I want to see how this plays just a little bit. But I expect that we're going to continue to see really good projects that get funded. ChooseIowa.com is the website. December 15th is the deadline. If you're someone who's looking to invest in value-added agriculture here in Iowa, you really need to check out this grant program and submit your application by December 15th. 
Next up is a topic that, if we're being honest, is probably not our favorite conversation to discuss, but it's so important for farmers to understand. Of course, I'm talking about farm income taxes. Iowa State University Extension tax expert Charles Brown is here to help us get prepared. Spokesman editor Tom Block takes it from here. We're here with Charles Brown, Iowa State University Farm Management Specialist, to talk about tax issues that farmers should be aware of as they prepare their 2022 returns. Charles, before we get into specific tax situations, are there any general income tax recommendations that you have for farmers? Any general best practices that you recommend to make sure farmers are getting off on the right foot or maybe missteps that you'd encourage them to avoid? Well, I think for the one of the main things is that for any farmer to have a good set of records, uh, it's hard to know where you're at without a good set of records. So have those and have them up to date. Uh, I know sometimes... Uh, uh, bookkeeping is not on the high list for what farmers like to do, <laughs> so they will procrastinate and and uh, don't do those books till December sometime. But uh, know where you're at uh, before you uh, you know talk to your tax preparer. Uh, have some plans in place and don't look at just 2022, but look at 23 and 24 and 25. Look down the road to see where your income might be. Uh, that might help on your planning for 2022. Let's talk about 2022 specifically now. What are some key tax issues or changes farmers need to be aware of as they finish out the year and plan to file their taxes? Well, there wasn't really a lot of new things that happened in general on the federal side here for tax returns for 2022 for farmers. Now, one of the th things that is happening is that the Section 179 for depreciation that's been an index for inflation every year. That's up now to a million and eighty thousand dollars now. So a farmer can write off a lot of machinery if, if he wishes to. That sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But again, with the price of machinery today, uh, uh, combines now over a million dollars. Uh, uh, confinement buildings you're talking about, to, you know, a couple million dollars for a confinement building for for hogs and such. Uh, it isn't hard to spend that money if you're farming quite a few acres. The 179, they can pick any dollar amount that they wish to. It can be spread amongst uh, different pieces of machinery. It doesn't have to be all in one piece of machinery. It's a very flexible thing that farmers can do to help uh, manage their taxes. Some farmers may collect crop insurance payments this year from drought or other crop problems. How should farmers handle crop insurance and disaster payments? This year, we ended up with the fall prices for corn actually higher than what the spring price was. So there will not be any price loss for, for corn if there are any losses. Uh, for soybeans though, the fall price came in a little bit lower than what the spring price was. So there could be some losses due to price uh, for soybeans. Matter of fact, I just talked to an insurance agent this morning and she was surprised at the claims they were having coming in on, on soybeans uh, because of the price differential. But if farmers do have a loss, uh, they have an option to defer that income to the following year if they would have sold more than 50% of that crop in, in the following year. Uh, that is the election they have to make. I think it's a Section 451 election on their return. Uh, they got to file a addendum to their returns saying that they did do that. But farmers can only defer crop insurance if it's due to a yield loss. They cannot defer it if it's due to a price loss. So again, for corn, it'd have to be a, a yield loss to defer it uh, for soybeans also. But again, for soybeans, if there is a loss, they may have to make an allocation. What's the loss due to price and what's the loss due to yield? But again, IRS states that you can only defer uh, crop insurance if it's due to a yield loss and not price loss. So that's something that yeah, definitely they'll need to keep track of the difference from there. Uh, what forms or other documentations do farmers need to have lined up as they get ready to go meet with their tax preparer? Well, again, uh, at the end of the year, there are a lot of forms that farmers need to be aware of. If they have employees specifically, there's the W-2s they have to send out. If they've hired people to do contract work for them or custom work, like custom combine, for example, or if they're paying rent to someone, there is the 1099s they have to send out. Those are mostly all due by the end of uh, January of the following year. Along with those uh, payroll things, there's also W-4s that farmers are supposed to give to their employees to fill out and put those in their file. 
it lets the employer know uh, names and addresses and social security numbers and also whether or not they are supposed to be withholding uh, taxes on those employees. And then there's the pseudo tax, the state unemployment tax. Again, for agriculture employers, if they pay more than $20,000 in a calendar quarter for W-2 wages, then they're also subject to paying the unemployment tax to the state of Iowa. It's over $20,000 in a calendar quarter. It makes no difference what they're on for their tax year. They maybe have a different fiscal year because they're a corporation, but it's based on calendar quarters, not the fiscal year quarters. There's also the federal unemployment tax that goes along with that, but that's basically just a yearly filing, whereas the pseudo tax, that's a quarterly filing that they have to make. It's not a huge tax that they have to pay, but again, it's more paperwork, more forms to fill out and such. Again, not things that a lot of farmers uh, do like to do, but some ways to get around the pseudo tax. It only applies to cash wages, and farmers can pay their employees with payment in kind, like bushels of corn or bushels of soybeans, and those are not considered to be cash wages, and they do not count against the $20,000 figure for a calendar quarter. So if they're bumping up against that $20,000, maybe they need to look at paying some wages payment kind rather than cash so they don't get involved having to pay the pseudo and the feudal taxes. Along with the 1099s, there is a new form, new to make people aware of, I guess. It's the W-9 form. And the W-9 form is a form that you send out to anybody you've paid for custom work, a contract labor, and so on that you're going to issue a 1099 to. Again, it's just an information form uh, that people you send this to. Uh, they fill out with their name and address and their tax ID numbers. They send that back to the uh, farmers, and they put that in their file. Again, it just tells IRS, if you're asked, you know, where you got the information from. This has been out there for many years for other businesses, uh, but farmers really weren't aware of it till just recently. I had a uh, farmer that called me uh, over a year ago. He had an error on a 1099 he'd sent out for Social Security numbers, and the IRS asked him for his W-9 forms. Well, of course, he didn't have any. <laughs> and the result was that IRS was going to assess him the taxes on that income for all those 1099s he sent out. It was like $65,000. But he was able to talk IRS out of paying the tax by going back through previous years and looking at 1099s he sent out earlier and such. But again, this is a form that you should have in your file. It doesn't really cause a lot of headaches. And technically, if the if you send this out to the person, they don't send it back to you. They're subject to a $50 fine for not sending it back to you. But it's just an information form that farmers should have in their file along with all their other forms that they do have. Of course, farmers' tax returns are, are due March 15th. So... Keep those dates in mind for following your tax returns. Farmers can pay an estimate by January the 15th. And if they do that, uh, then it extends their filing date to April the 15th. And a lot of farmers do do that to give more time to get the returns prepared. Are there any other tax changes that could affect farmers' 2022 filings or for future years? Well, one of the biggest things of uh, this year, and this actually will take effect in 2023, not 2022, but Iowa has passed a law starting in 23 that retirement income will not be subject to Iowa income tax. So this includes for most individuals, their pensions, social security, and so on. But farmers, a lot of farmers don't have those pension plans. You know, their retirement basically is their farmland. So what they included into the law is that if a farmer is 55 or disabled, and they are running out their farm ground, they can make an election not to include that income for Iowa income tax. So in other words, any rent, whether it's crop share, whether it's a case rent, uh, would not be taxed on the Iowa return. This does not affect the federal return, but just the Iowa return. Now, if they do that, Iowa also has in place, if a farmer meets the criteria, they've held the land for a long period of time and so on, and they sell that farmland, Uh, Iowa has an Iowa capital gains exclusion. So they wouldn't have to pay any tax on the gain of that farm when it was sold. 
But if they make the election not to pay tax on the income, then they forgive the possibility of not having to pay tax on the capital gain. So you can't have both. It's going to be one or the other. So it's a pretty good deal, but it's not just a cut and dried thing. A lot of people think, well, no tax on the income. That sounds good to me. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. But if they sell the farm a couple of years down the road and they, they got to pay all the tax on the, on the gain on that farm, uh, maybe that wasn't such a good deal. Also, Iowa has in place where if they rent the farm to a qualified beginning farmer, they get some credits on their Iowa tax returns. And again, if they elect not to pay taxes on the income, they also can't utilize up these credits that they may get. So uh, farmers need to visit with their tax preparers and also think down the road, you know, a few years and uh, just not make a quick decision on whether or not to make that election not to pay tax on the income. It doesn't apply for what they call flow through income. So if a farmer is involved in an S corporation, for example, and the land is owned by the S corporation receiving the rent, uh, then there, there is no election not to pay taxes on the, on the income. Uh, the same thing would be true for partnerships. Uh, they also can make the election not to pay taxes on the income. Now we do think, and again, we haven't seen the final rules on this yet, but there's been a question about the trust. But a revocable trust doesn't pay any taxes. So we think if they have the land in the revocable trust, that they will still be able to make the election not to be taxed on the income. We also think LLCs, limited liability companies, if they have more than one member of the LLC, they have to file a partnership return, they will not be able to make the election. But you can have a single member LLC, which is called a disregarded entity. And if they have that, again, there's no partnership return filed. And we think that they ought to be able to make the election and not to be taxed on, on the income if they wish. Again, the final rules haven't been drafted yet, but uh, these are some of the assumptions we're making by reading the information that we do have. So something definitely to watch there and keep an eye on for the future as you make those choices, it sounds like. Sure. As we look again towards the end of this year, are there any tax strategies that farmers should consider before the end of the year that can help them reduce their tax burden if they have an unexpectedly high or low adjusted gross income? Yeah, there's lots of things that farmers can do to manage their income tax. So again, the key is for most of these things is to make those decisions before December 31st <laughs> and not try to make it after the first of the year. And again, it depends on the farmer's situation, but $83,000 of taxable income is about the top of the, I think that's the 12% bracket that the farmers have today or any any individual has. So if they're trying to you know, maximize out that bracket, what can they do uh, income-wise to, to do that? Also, farmers should always have enough income to use up those deductions that the government gives you. I think that the itemized deductions for 22 is about $25,000. That's a reduction of your income. If you don't have enough income to utilize that, that that's lost. You can't carry the unused portion to the, to the following year. One of the examples I gave in the webinar that we did was a farmer was going to be showing a real loss on his return, uh, not being able to use up those deductions. But if he were to increase his income by about $44,000, he'd be able to use up his deductions as far as the standard deduction. Uh, he had two children, and again, you get $2,000 for each child as a credit against your taxes. So you could utilize those. He would have to pay, I think it was roughly around $6,000 in self-employment tax, but he would pay no federal income tax on that money. That's basically tax-free money. If he did not do that and just disregarded it and showed the loss on the return, but uh, shoved the income into uh, next year, and then he had the same income that, that next year also, it actually may cost him around $6,000 more in taxes than he would have by trying to split the income between the two years. So again, try to manage your taxes, try to manage your income, try to manage your, your tax brackets. Farmers can prepay expenses. Uh, they can prepay fertilizer, seed, chemicals. Uh, there's a lot of checks written that last week in December <laughs> when farmers kind of realize maybe what they're going to have for income and they don't like the, the consequences. You can also prepay up to 12 months rent if you wish to. Now, sometimes the landlord may not want his rent payment and get paid twice in one year. 
but they can mail that check out December 31st and still call it, take it as a deduction. The landlord, if he's a cash basis taxpayer, didn't actually receive it until 2023. So he reports on his 23 return and doesn't have to get uh, rent doubled up in, in one year. So a prepaying expenses. Uh, also, I think one of the things that to me, it really is a, a good tax planning feature. If you have a lot of grain in storage and you like the price now, matter of fact, I just saw where Cargill had a bid for $7 if delivered by November 26th. But if you like the price, but you don't want to really take the income this year, you can sell that grain, deliver the grain, lock in the price, but sell it on deferred payment contract. Now, again, it has to be a legitimate deferred payment contract. Uh, that contract needs to state that you're, you cannot be paid until some date in 2023. But if you get to the end of the year and you figure out, uh, I made a mistake and, and I really need the income this year, for cash basis taxpayers, IRS allows you to pull that contract back into 2022, call it as income, even though you didn't receive the income to 2023. But it has to be contract by contract. It cannot be a partial contract. So the idea is to have multiple smaller contracts uh, so you have more flexibility in pulling income back into 2022 if you made an oops and decided that you really need the income here in 2022. So deferred payment contract really makes it flexible on trying to manage your income. Again, this just works for cash basis taxpayers. If they're accrual, uh, that does not work. Well, obviously, farm taxes can be complicated. There's a lot of details farmers have to take into consideration. Sometimes it's helpful to receive this education in a number of different ways. Where can farmers go to learn more? Iowa State University has the Center for Ag and Law Taxation. Christine Tigrin is the director of that, and she does a great job in publishing articles on what's happening currently with you know tax laws and EPA regulations and anything that deals with farmers on the legal side of it. But again, they can just do a search for the Center for Ag and Law Taxation and go there and find out some helpful articles on what's happening with taxes. I know she has a great article there on this new Iowa retirement election that, that Iowa farmers can make if they wish. Uh, and once in a while, there's a blog on Ag Decision Maker also about taxes too. But, uh, but the Center for Ag and Law Taxation would be a good place to go. Most definitely. With all the law changes, always good to talk to your farm accountant and, and have a good tax man, right? That is correct. You know, there are tax preparers out there, and then there are tax planners out there. And it used to be that farmers would just take their information in to their tax preparer. He would make all the calculations on how, how much tax they owed. But if farmers really want to do a good job, they need to work with somebody that's a tax planner. You go in before the end of the year, uh, kind of figure out where you're at, or what maybe you can do to manage your taxes and to make some plans. But uh, uh, all those things work a lot better in November, December than they do in January, February the following year. Thanks, Charles. There's always a lot of ground to cover when it comes to farm income taxes, and Charles gave us a really good start there. If you'd like even more information on this topic, I definitely recommend that you check out a longer form webinar that Charles Brown and Christine Tidgren, who's the director of the Center for Agricultural Law and Taxation, presented earlier this month. We've included a link to that free recorded webinar in the notes for this podcast episode, so you can find it down there. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. We hope you found it useful and that you'll join next week when we'll be bringing you three more episodes featuring three young Iowa farmers who will be recognized for their outstanding local leadership at Iowa Farm Bureau's annual meeting. Those special episodes will be released on December 5th, 6th, and 7th. And if you're subscribed to The Spokesman Speaks, you'll be the first to know when they're available. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. 
We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.